Hey everyone, I'm John Lynn, the founder and chief editor at Healthcare IT Today. Excited to bring you a really interesting technology, and it's really an evolution of a technology in healthcare. Uh, and our special guest today is Clive Smith. He's the CEO and founder of Think Labs. Welcome, Clive. Thanks. Good to be here. Yeah, so uh, before we dive into the technology I talked about, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and Think Labs. So, um, so I am from my voice, people sometimes ask, so we might as well get rid of that. My background and my accent is South African. Okay. Uh, and I uh, came to America to uh, do graduate study and uh, my background is in electrical engineering. So I came here and did electrical engineering and my core discipline is engineering design. And um, Think Labs is a company that I founded to develop tech various technologies, but we ended up actually focusing on digital stethoscopes um, as an area of focus. And that's what we've become specialists in. Excellent. Well, I love the evolution of this uh, digital stethoscope or other digital technologies of, you know, digital thermometers, <laughs> blood pressure cuffs, et cetera. I think it's a, a fascinating area, especially as remote patient monitoring evolves. But give people an idea, how has the, how has the stethoscope changed and what makes the Think Labs uh, one thing? One th stethoscope, is that how you uh, say it? it what makes it special? Think Labs one. Yeah, Think Labs okay. one. Perfect. So what makes the Think Labs one uh, special compared to other stethoscopes? Yeah. So, uh, so essentially a little bit of history, if we're looking at the evolution of the stethoscope. So the stethoscope uh, essentially was invented about 200 years ago. Maybe and enough. It was a hollow tube. And then it evolved as a hollow tube until today. Most people still listen to patients through a hollow tube. The form changed from a long, um, essentially like a pipe. It was a wooden, a hollowed out wooden pipe. And that was the first original stethoscope used with one ear. Somebody just listened at the end of a pipe, the inventor Lenek, um, and wrote a book uh, and coined the word auscultation from the French to listen to patients. And um, that was the beginning. And then in about the American Civil War period, um, a, the binaural stethoscope with the tubing and two, you know, two ear pieces was formed, essentially creating the form factor that has become an icon of medicine. Yeah, there was sure. there was you know American Civil War, yeah. um, the and then essentially it kind of evolved slowly since then with almost no change, um, and I got into it because I came across I was doing some general research on something. And I was in a medical school library looking things up and, and I stumbled across this research paper on the, on the stethoscope and that uh, someone had done a study where they had compared various stethoscopes and their acoustics and they'd actually made a replica of the original 1816 invention by Lenec in France, this hollow pipe. And they found that the acoustics of the hollow pipe were basically the same as what people use today. Wow. So I looked at that and I thought like, okay, this is ridiculous. It's the most used <laughs> medical device. It has never improved acoustically from the day that it was invented, basically. And it's time to create a revolution. Yeah, it's time to change the most fundamental tool. And that's how I got into it. And I started researching it. And it actually, I spent eight years perfecting the sound and developing and inventing technologies before I actually put the first units on the market. Um, I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. Um, and so I kind of really wanted to make something that really, really sounded good. And that foundation has been the foundation of Think Labs right from the beginning, which is what we're really known for is very, very high performance acoustics. And that's what I really laid the groundwork for. And so what I did was I developed a proprietary acoustic uh, contact sensing technology to detect the sounds coming from the human body wow. and uh, patented it and uh, put it on the market. Um, and that's essentially how things evolved. And the Think Labs one that we have today, the is a, a small device uh, for people who are listening and can't see anything. Essentially, it's just a small little cylindrical device. Think of 
if you know what a regular stethoscope looks like, just the part that the doctor holds or the nurse holds to apply to the patient without any of the tubing, that's the size of our electronic device. And it works with earbud headphones. And so the form factor is extremely small, extremely compact, but it's actually a hundred times louder than a regular stethoscope. It can be, of wow. course, you don't need to listen to it. <laughs> but it can really, it can really amplify um, very subtle sounds. And that's the foundation of what we have. And so that was the, the story, the origin story. And from there, we've moved into telemedicine and, you know, remote capabilities and during COVID, we got into we got into it before during the Ebola uh, epidemic. Actually, um, helping doctors listen to patients while being protected. We were familiar with the whole PPE problem back in yep. 2014, and so when the whole PPE thing came around this time, we already had experienced how do you, how do you help people listen to patients, doctors and nurses listen to patients. Uh, with that while still protecting themselves. And you can't do that with a regular stethoscope. So the digital stethoscope is not just a, an electronic version of the conventional and a replacement for the conventional stethoscope. The digital stethoscope gives you capability that you don't get with a normal stethoscope. Telemedicine, remote listening, recording, um, you know, being able to create form factors that work with PPE that you don't have to get too close to patients and so on. That's really interesting. And I, I feel like I'm on a, a, a episode of the history channel. It's amazing. <laughs> I love it. It seems like they need to, you know, one of those uh, shows on there, but I, I love it, right? The evolution, but is that really, I mean, from a core diagnostic standpoint, is it the same as a regular stethoscope, but it provides these other capabilities such as doing it remotely or recording it so that you can listen to it later. But from a diagnostic standpoint, is it essentially the same? Yeah, so that's a great question. We're at, a, we're at an inflection point on that. Today, physicians, clinicians, nurses use the stethoscope in terms of whether they're listening on ours or they're listening on a conventional stethoscope. They are doing the same thing clinically. Okay. They're listening, they're hearing heart sounds, they're hearing heart murmurs, they're hearing crackles and wheezes from the lungs, and they're interpreting it based on their own experience. Gotcha. And whether you're using an electronic digital stethoscope or using a regular stethoscope and you've got the patient in front of you, you're doing the same thing. So the diagnosis and the diagnostic process is the same. If you are in a telemedicine situation, it allows you to do it remotely. If you're in an emergency room and you've got a shortage of PPE like we, we have when we have these, when we've had these pandemic yeah. weeks, and you're trying to save PPE, you might stay outside the room and have somebody transmitting by, via Bluetooth transmitter from inside the room to outside the room at a distance to stay safe, not have to suit up in PPE and still listen. But fundamentally, from a diagnostic point of view to your question, you're still making a human interpretation of a sound that you're hearing. And you're doing it in real time most of the time, although you can record and listen to it later. The inflection point that I referred to is that where we are headed was we're, we're headed into artificial intelligence. Right. I was going to say that needs to be the future, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so there's a little bit of that going on. Um, there's quite a lot of research going on, you know, that, you know, people that, you know, we're obviously aware of because we're at the hub of a, you know, of a nexus of a lot of research that's going on in this area. So we're very familiar with what's going on behind the scenes. And there's a lot of work going on in interpretation, in automated machine learning, right. capturing sounds, doing analysis, and that's where it's all going in the future. And that goes to the whole pro the thing that you're very aware of, which is that healthcare is becoming digital, healthcare is becoming automated at some level, at least frontline or screening. Is there a murmur? Isn't there a murmur? Um, you know, what's the condition that the patient's in? What are their lung conditions like? If you can actually push that out into machine learning and push that out into AI, what you can do is that you can do a lot of remote patient monitoring, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where it's headed. Yeah. 
It sounds so much like a recent interview I did with a live core. They started first with the, exactly what you're describing, the clinician getting access to the ECG, uh, and now they're doing the AI on top of it to help facilitate that or screen for it, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So it's totally. interesting to see that evolution from uh, the stethoscope side. Yeah, of yeah, totally. The alignment and the analogy that you've drawn there is, 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 a, is an excellent one in that essentially a live core is looking at the electrophysiology they're looking at the electrical activity of the heart yep the you know the the electrical impulses that cause the heart muscle to contract mm -hmm. what we're doing is that we're listening to the mechanical consequences of the electrical activity of the heart so if you think about you know an analogy of a, of a car right you've got the electrical system which is going to cause the spark, you know, trigger the spark plugs, uh -huh. which is going to basically be the electrical stimulus that causes those pistons to, to, you know, to, to go around. Yep. And then what you can do is you can listen to the engine and you need to look at the electrical activity of the spark plugs and you need to listen to the engine to get a full picture. What a great so analogy. What, so what we have is we have a complement there is that they're looking at the electrical side of the heart. We're looking and we're listening to the mechanical side of the heart what happens when the blood actually pumps and yeah. are there backflows, which cause, cause murmurs, um, you know, things like that. So Amazing. pretty much in the same space. Yeah, no, it's really interesting how you're approaching very similar path, but a, a different approach. So do you think this is something that everyone is going to have in their home? Kind of like we have a thermometer in our home, or is this only going to be for specific type of patients with specific needs? How do you th see that kind of evolving or will the doctors just keep it themselves? I think it's going to be in the home. Yeah. Yeah. We don't know when, you know, but it'll be in the home and, mm -hmm. um, in terms of your question about the patient profile, will it be for everyone or only some patients? You know, there, there's a whole huge chronic patient population, as you know. So, you know, that would be, you know, a population that might make more regular use of it. And then there's just the occasional user that might need to do a telemedicine visit. Yeah. But if you think about telemedicine with a stethoscope and without a stethoscope, um, a telemedicine visit with a stethoscope is a telemedicine visit. A telemedicine visit without a stethoscope is just a conversation. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I, I recently talked to Amwell, and, and uh, she argued that 80% of the diagnosis comes from the observational and historical data. So, you know, that, that, was, that would be her argument against needing the <laughs> devices. Of course, that's still 20%, which is important. I guess. Right. Well, well Amwell, um, Amwell customers use a lot of stethoscopes from us. Oh, yeah? So, uh, yeah. Sense. So, yeah, there are a lot of applications where you don't need it. Um, but when you need it, you really need it. Yeah. Well, I mean, it just has me as a patient, you know, it's like, do I need one of these? Would this be useful? <laughs> you know, and I think yeah. there's a wide variety. We're all asking that, right? I mean, I think pulse ox was something that's blown up because of COVID, right? Because that was possibly an indicator of issues, right? And, and you know, do we need a stethoscope? Do we need a blood pressure cuff? Do we need, <laughs> you know, I think we're all asking these questions uh, yeah. and we want to know. Yeah, you know, you think about it. If um, if if you if you're not feeling well and you contact your doctor mm -hmm. and they say, okay, well, we can do a televisit. Let's have a conversation. So you have a conversation and they say, you know, I'd really like to, you know, I'd like to know what your blood pressure is. And you say, well, I don't have a blood pressure um, monitor. Um, you know, you sound a little bit like you you're saying you're coughing. Uh, I wouldn't mind listening to your lungs and seeing if right. there's any congestion going on there. And you say, oh, well, I don't have a stethoscope. Um, what's the telemedicine you have to go in. <laughs> going to turn into? The telemedicine visit's going to turn into, well, you know what? I think I want to see you come into the office. Yep. So if we want telemedicine to be effective, we're going to need these, these devices at home. So mm -hmm. it's going to evolve that way and it'll take time. And, you know, we yeah. just don't know what the timeline looks like. And their argument uh, is that, okay, that's true. You're going to have to come in, but I might be able to tell you, don't go to the ED. You can wait till tomorrow and that's fine. Right. So, you know, there's some benefit, but yeah. it, you know, way better if you have it there, right. <laughs> then I don't yeah. have to come in at all. Yeah, that would be great. Of course it depends on the specialty and it depends what's wrong. Um, mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. You know, I've done, um, I've done dermatology telemedicine as a patient. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I had, uh, I ordered a bunch of dermatology cameras and things like that so that the dermatologist could get on and, yep, you know, he did, he, he did, you know, he didn't know that I'm in the, um, you know, in this kind of field and he, he came on and I said, well, I've got a camera, I've got this, I've got that, I've got the next thing. And he just said to me, wow, <laughs> you, we've never had a patient like this, like <laughs> that's so well equipped to, to do a real exam. Uh-huh. It was largely my interest. It was because I was interested in seeing, well, what's possible here in dermatology. So now in dermatology, you absolutely do not need a stethoscope. Yes. Uh, so, you know, there are many fields where you don't need it. And there's a lot of telepsychiatry, you know, and there's, you know, there's, sure. there's you know, various Gosh. kinds of, you know, mental health things and, th- you know, areas like that, you don't necessarily need it. But how did the doctor react? And, and you know, I mean, let's talk specifically about the Think Labs one, right? Like if I say, hey, do you want to listen to my heart? I have it. You know, how, how does, does the doctor need something to be able to hear it on a telehealth visit? Or how does that work? They just need headphones. Okay. Yeah, they just need headphones. And, um, and they need to be on a telemedicine system that actually, you know, transmits the sound well. Gotcha. And some of them do and some of them don't. And, you know, that's, you know, that's an evolving picture at the moment. Yeah, because that feels like the chicken and egg problem to me, right, is I don't want to buy one if my doctor won't use it. Or if I get on and say, hey, can you use it? And he's like, what's that? You know, sorry, yeah. you can't do it coming. But I also, you know, the doctors don't want to use it until it's integrated with their workflow. And, you know, yeah. so, I, you yeah. know, I'm not sure how, how do we address that? Is, is it just going to be, you know, specific implementations around specific disease states or things or, or are patients yeah. pushing it, I guess? Yeah, you know, I think it's a sort of classic diffusion of innovation they're going to be the early adopters and it's going to take a little bit of time and so among patients there'll probably be the sort of diffusion curve of like innovators early adopters and you'll see that and and you know they might educate the um they might educate the doctors in the same way as i you know sort of educated the dermatologist sure. it's like oh i guess we can do that at home you know, well, in the future, he might, they might send, put it in their email to the patient saying, if you'd like, you can get this thing on Amazon uh, mm-hmm. ahead of your appointment and it might be useful or something like that. Or if you have a specific uh, spot that you want the doctor to look at closely, you know, you may want to consider, et cetera. So I think that there's a little bit of the patients trying it and, and, and doctors, you know, following uh, and then the doctors will start recommending it to the patients. There'll be other situations where innovative doctors recommend it to their chronically ill patients and they say you know it's really useful i'm checking in on you once a month it would be convenient for you to have one of these and it's going to be a you know this is not going to be some simple process it's going to take time uh workflow is key you know you mentioned that and you know that's a key issue is workflow and how this all fit in um you know we're, we're figuring you know doctors are figuring out all the stuff as they go along and they're learning about it. And COVID has been, COVID has been a catalyst for sure for, for enormous change. Um, you know, it's a very regrettable, unfortunate and tragic catalyst. Um, but it has, you know, it's, it's going to cause changes that are going to be permanent. Yeah, absolutely. So what other areas do you think we'll see this type of, innovation from home medical devices you know is what other devices do you think you'll see are you guys looking at other areas or are you really just focus on the think labs one and the stethoscope yeah we're looking at other areas but i've always said we're looking at other areas and what tends to happen is that we have become such specialists and we've got so much demand from customers who are looking for stethoscope sort mm-hmm. of centric solutions right that we tend to our customers tend to keep us very focused and make us a very, very specialized company. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in theory, we could go into adjacent markets. We've got the sales channels. We've got the technologies. You know, a lot of these technologies are not complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, in terms of our own company, uh, you know, we will be expanding where we're going. Um, the, in terms of what other devices are going to be in the home, this is just going to keep on evolving. Um, eventually, the hospital is going to be in the home. And what I mean by that is 
the the patient is going to need many many patients will be discharged from the hospital to be monitored at home and as the technology evolves there'll be much more home monitoring so at the moment it's the it's the you know the pulse ox device it's the blood pressure monitor it's the electronic stethoscope it's the alive core ekg it's you know various items that are you know that are you know coming along but I think where, where is this really going to go? This is going to go to where there's actually there are, will be bedside monitors in the home mm. and patients will be recovering with proper monitoring remotely. That's where I think this is all going. Interesting. So I don't think, I don't think that, I don't think that, you know, the, the, the envelope's going to keep getting pushed in terms of what's in the home. There are so many incentives for doing that. And healthcare is fundamentally unaffordable. <laughs> um, hospital beds are unaffordable, you know, putting someone in a hospital bed is unaffordable. And, you know, healthcare reform that we saw in, in the 2010s, you know, with um, Affordable Care Act and all that kind of thing, and the debate that's gone on in the political arena has been really not so much about innovation and technology that's going to lower the price and the cost of healthcare. It's all been an argument about who's paying the bill. The bill is unaffordable. It's unaffordable <laughs> by anybody. Yep. I've by said the anybody. same. American healthcare is completely unaffordable under any payment circumstances, no matter what, whether it's the taxpayer, whether it's taxing wealth, there are no solutions. You have to bring down the cost of delivery. So I think that ultimately that's going to sweep this. The technology is going to sweep. The technology is going to lower the cost. The technology is going to be in the patient's hands. And also the other impetus is that we've already moved over the last few years towards um, essentially high deductible insurance, right? right? Yep. The patient is on the hook for much more cost. What's that going to do? That's going to consumerize healthcare more because now the patient is responsible for making spending decisions at a level that they'd never used to care about. So that's going to cause consumers to become more engaged in what are my choices? Oh, I can do this at home. I can have a choice to be monitored at home. I can do remote patient monitoring. So all these things. So, you know, as I said, COVID has been a catalyst. And that's where we're going is basically there were a whole lot of things in the wings waiting to develop. Digital healthcare, remote monitoring, AI, yep. uh, more patients in the home, more consumerization. All these things were sort of bubbling under the surface. And now they come into the fore and they get accelerated. And the 2020s, we're going to see technology as one of the, you know, a, a, as a focus of where the innovation happens. And not, to, not just going to be about healthcare is what it is. And the only thing we're arguing and fighting about is who's going to pay for it. Well, I agree completely. Uh, and I hope you're right. <laughs> you know, I think that, you know, hopefully the technology and the drive of consumers will push that cost down because if it doesn't, I agree with you completely. No one can afford it in any model. Um, so yep. I think it's a really great point. So yep. what's next for Think Labs and uh, where can people find this? Can, can, can we go order it on Amazon or <laughs> you know, how, do, how, do we, uh, how do you get the Think Labs? Yeah, so it, uh, um, right now it's a prescription device. So mm -hmm. you would get it through your doctor. Gotcha. Um, for a situation where you need to be monitored remotely and things like that. You should talk to your doctor, introduce your doctor to it. Uh, you can find us on thinklabs.com. It's a think as in using your brains and labs as in the abbreviation for laboratories, thinklabs.com. And um, yeah, that's where people can find us. And is this FDA cleared or however you approached FDA clearance? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a class two FDA device. Perfect. Well, thanks so much, Clive. I appreciate you taking the time to educate us on the history of the stethoscope and where it's going. It looks really interesting and I need to find a doctor to prescribe me one, but <laughs> thanks so much yeah. for sharing your knowledge and thanks everyone for watching. If you want to find more great healthcare IT content like this, be sure to check it out at healthcareittoday.com. Thanks, Clive. Thanks. Thanks. Great talking to you.